Hello, I'm Robert McCorkadale. I'm a professor of international and human rights at the University of Nottingham. I'm a barrister of Brick Court Chambers in London, and I'm founder and principal of Inclusive Law, a consultancy in business and human rights. And for 10 years, I had the pleasure of being the director of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. Well, today we're looking at issues in relation to education. And I'll begin with what the introduction of the second edition of the International Handbook on Protecting Education in Insecurity and Armed Conflict, what it begins with. And it says this, and I'll quote, education can provide a sense of normality for those living in situations of insecurity or armed conflict, as it is a key concern of communities, including children and their caretakers in crisis situations, education has been construed as humanitarian need. In addition, education is the single most vital element in combating poverty, empowering women, and promoting human rights and democracy in situations of insecurity and armed conflict. Education also has an important role in providing in promoting the rule of law and a culture of lawfulness, and it provides an important protective function for strengthening learners' abilities to face and overcome difficult life situations. And in order to fulfill these functions, it's important that children have access to schools and also a high quality of learning during insecurity and armed conflict. As being in school isn't the same thing as learning. And then the handbook goes on to say this, underpinning this handbook and noting the complex legal and practical issues it tackles is a foundational view that education is not only an important end in itself. It is an enabling right, empowering access to other human rights, to meaningful participation in society, and to the promotion of in, uh, universal respect for the dig dignity of all. It is a right deserving of protection by all of us. Now, this is a very powerful statement, but, and it needs to be put in the context of more than 22,000 students, teachers, and academics were injured, killed, or harmed in the more than 11,000 attacks on education during armed conflict or insecurity over the past five years. It shows why this handbook, which uniquely examines international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and international criminal law in relation to education in insecurity and armed conflict is so needed. And this book also indicates the importance of education as to why schools should be self safe places. In fact, in order to ensure that states around the world commit to their protection, the Safe Schools Declaration was adopted in 2015, and to date 102 states around the world have agreed to it, which Stephen will speak to later. And the importance of education is also why the Abidjan principles on human rights obligations of states to provide public education and to regulate private involvement in education was adopted in February 2019, which Delphine will speak about later. Now, of course, as many of us know during COVID, the protection of education can have an impact in our lives, our work, and also in our own homes, when we realize just how unable we are to teach our children when trying to do homeschooling. So it's my pleasure to introduce this event, which as well as having expert speakers, also launches the second edition of the Protecting Education in Security and Armed Conflict and International Law Handbook. This is authored by Kristen Hausler of Bickel and with the assistance of Nicole Urban, Siobhan Smith and me. And in cooperation with the Protect Education in Security and Conflict, a program of education above all, which is a Qatar-based policy research and advocacy organization concerned with protecting the right to education insecurity and conflict, to whom we give our thanks. Above all, this handbook is freely available online. Yes, freely available, and the product of a long-standing cooperation with education above all. On a personal note, I give huge credit to Kristen, who has been working on these issues and managing the handbooks and updates for nearly a decade since I first engaged with EAA when I was director of the Corps. It has not been an easy undertaking, and she is the star educator. Now to our speakers, in the order of which they'll speak, I'll introduce the three of them. Siobhan Smith is a lecturer at Salford University, 
after having been an intern at the Global Coalition to Protect Education from Attack. She obtained a PhD in January this year, well done, from Lancaster University, which examines whether the, and her PhD examines whether the current legal provisions within international human rights law and international humanitarian law relevant to indications of situations of non-international armed conflict are effective in practice. And she looked at Colombia and the Democratic Republic of Congo as case examples. Most importantly, of course, she was a co-author of the handbook. Delphine Dorsey is the director of the Right to Education Initiative, which is an international human rights organization focusing on the right to education. She is a lawyer specialized in human rights and has been working for more than 10 years in the field of the right to education, including at UNESCO and in several NGOs in Europe and Africa. She's part of the secretariat that facilitated the development of the Abidjan principles on the right to education and supports the implementation. She holds a research master's in human rights from the University of Strasbourg. Stephen Haynes is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Greenwich and a former senior officer in the British Armed Forces. He chaired the editorial board of the UK's Law of Armed Conflict Manual. His military service included deployments to NATO's K-4 in Pristina, Kosovo, and to the UK's Joint Force Headquarters in Sierra Leone, during both of which he witnessed the military use of education facilities. He wrote the International Guidelines on the Protection of Schools and Universities for military use during conflict. So the format of this session is going to be that each speaker will speak for about six to eight minutes, and then I'll ask them a couple of questions. There will then be a period where all of you listening can ask questions. I encourage you to do so using the Q&A button and to do it as we go along so that when we finish, there's an opportunity to immediately begin looking at your questions. And Kristen, uh, who is uh, assisting in this, will gather these questions and then we'll ask them to the speakers. So with no more introduction from me, I pass you to Siobhan. Siobhan. Thank you, Robert. I'd first like to say I'm sorry for bit of the fact that I'm in my car. I had Wi-Fi problems and this was the quietest spot with a good Wi-Fi connection. Um, but as to my talk, I'll first provide an overview of the handbook and then I'll move on to give a brief overview of why the handbook is important. So what does the handbook do? It provides an overview of international law relevant to the protection of education in insecurity and armed conflict. But the handbook goes beyond the right to education under international human rights law and also considers how education is protected through the rules of international humanitarian law and how perpetrators of crimes that impact education are punished under international criminal law. The second edition is a revised and updated version so that it includes the latest legal developments in case law and I'll provide some of the few some of the key developments in the law since the first edition was published in 2012. So firstly, there has been an increase in recognition within various UN reports, concluding observations and resolutions of a general negative impact of insecurity and armed conflict on education, particularly in respect to its disproportionate effects on certain vulnerable groups, such as children, women and girls, those with disabilities, minorities and indigenous peoples, and so on. There's also been an increase in recognition in such UN reports, observations and resolutions of an increase in certain practices during insecurity and armed conflict that have an impact on students, education staff and education itself, such as um, enforced disappearances, child military recruitment, trafficking, economic exploitation, sexual violence and other gender based violence. There's also been generally an increase in the number of states that have ratified the relevant international instruments that protect education in insecurity and armed conflict. But the handbook recognises that greater ratification and effective implementation of these instruments is still needed. There are also new individual complaint mechanisms before UN treaty bodies, such as the optional protocol to the Co Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which entered into force in 2013, and the optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child on a Communications Procedure, which entered into force in 2014. Though again, more states need to ratify them as the numbers of these are still quite low. And it's also important that, st that states fully engage and cooperate with all the relevant treaty monitoring bodies and procedures. There's also the adoption of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which includes the Sustainable Development Goals, in particular Goal 4 in Education, and the Incheon Declaration and Framework for Action for the Implementation of Sustainable Development Goal 4. And these are key developments since the first edition in respect of the value in assisting states in working towards the full realisation of the right to education 
Similarly, Abid Jam principles on human rights obligations to states provide to provide public education and regulate private involvement in education were adopted in 2019, which Delphine will talk about in more detail. I just wanted to point out that they were included within the handbook and they also assist states in working towards a full realisation of the right to education. Similarly, with the Safe School Declaration adopted in 2015, it's also an important development which is discussed in the handbook, which Steve will talk about in more detail shortly. Other key developments in the law are the fact is the Lubanga case at the International Criminal Court which was important because it led to a recognition of missed educational opportunities for those children that were rec that were recruited into armed forces. There have also been considerable advancements in International Criminal Court since 2012 on the issue of reparations flowing from the decisions on reparations in respect to Lubanga but also Katanga and also Al Mahdi. So why then is the handbook important? As Robert's already indicated, since the first edition, attacks on education have continued worldwide. Some of the most notable attacks have been the fact that on October the 9th, 2012, not long after the publication of the first edition of the handbook, in Pakistan, a 15-year-old schoolgirl named Malala, who I'm sure many have heard of, was shot in the head and critically wounded because she'd spoken out against the Taliban banning school, girls from attending classes and the bombing of schools. On the 14th of April 2014, Boko Haram fighters abducted more than 270 girls from a secondary school in Chibok, Nigeria, and they also destroyed the school. More than 200 girls remained captive for years, and at the time of writing the handbook, many still remained missing. In South Sudan, between December 2013 and 2016, armed forces and non-state armed groups are reported to have used at least 161 schools for military purposes. In 2015, it was estimated that approximately 708,000 Syrian refugee children were residing in Turkey, more than 400,000 of whom were not attending schools. But why is it important to prevent such attacks? One of the most compelling reasons is the fact that protecting education during conflict and insecurity is that education can itself be the cause of a conflict if it's not provided in a manner that's representative of all of those who live in that particular territory. And it can also be the solution to a conflict if it's administered in a way that promotes peace and tolerance and respect of others. Another particularly compelling reason is that the handbook deals with the protection of children. It also deals with the protection of adults, but children in particular are one of the most vulnerable groups in society due to their reliance on help from adults. Education in particular is an enabling right. It empowers access to other human rights, such as the right to health, work, freedom of expression, and it's also considered enabling in the sense that it empowers meaningful participation in society. It promotes the rule of law and a culture of lawfulness. As Robert's already said in his introduction, children and families have recognised education as a key concern, and it provides a sense of normality in situations of conflict and insecurity. And particularly in protracted conflict situations, conflict itself can deprive entire generations of a good quality education, and it results in generations of uneducated adults who are destined for a life of poverty, with a country with very little chance of economic growth, political stability, or security. For example, the Rohingya, Syrian, and Yemeni children have been referred to as a lost generation as a result of missed educational opportunity. And the failure to protect education, which includes higher education, can result in a future of a future without a generation of scientists, engineers, physicians, teachers and leaders. So for that reason, the handbook is an incredibly important source and it shows that education is in need of protection. Thank you. Impressive keeping to time. Thanks very much, uh, Siobhan. And your car didn't move in that time at all. Uh, and now we pass to Delphine. So I'm going to share my screen um, to show you the, some elements. So, sorry. Yes, you should be able to see my screen now, yes? So uh, I'm going to present the Abidjan principle on the right to education. So also called the guiding principle on the human rights obligation of states to provide public education uh, and to regulate private involvement in education. So 
So the Abidjan principle, what they are, they are a human rights guiding principle. And so they are human, uh, a soft law, a legal text that provide an authoritative interpretation of the law regarding specifically the right to education. So the obligation of states to provide public education and to regulate private actors. So it's not a binding instrument, but they reflect existing human rights law and therefore binding, uh, binding obligation of states. And they aim to be a practical tool to provide specific guidance to states, but also to um, other education uh, actors in implementing the right to education, specifically in the context of the rapid expansion uh, of private actor involvement in education. Um, they have been adopting following a three-year uh, process, uh, including an analysis of the law, background paper made by international lawyer, uh, and um, education experts with the input of uh, education, uh, educationalists on the ground, including a uh, community. So you can see on the right side a picture uh, in, a, in a slum in Kenya where people have been consulted to make sure the law uh, meets the reality and can be applied to the specific uh, issue. So there have been six uh, regional consultations uh, and online consultation uh, over these three, three years. And they have been uh, drafted by a, a committee of uh, nine human rights experts chaired by Anne Skelton, uh, which is um, a member of the Committee on the Rights of the Child and an uh, international uh, law professor. Um, and as I said, this has been facilitated by a secretariat of five organizations, including uh, the Right to Education Initiative. So it's have been adopted in February 2019 in Abidjan. Uh, what was unique in this process is the fact like 80, uh, about 80 uh, members of uh, civil society organization have been there as observer and able to provide input during the discussion of the experts. Uh, and on the, on the right side, you can see the Ministry of Education of Cote d'Ivoire and the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education together with Anne Skelton. Uh, so, so far it's been adopted by and signed by uh, 56 experts uh, from all over the world, which includes uh, 60%, more than 60% from Global South and more than 60% women, which was uh, important for representativities. And you can see that on the picture. Um, so it's have been recognized already uh, widely. So including at UN level, for instance, by a UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Education, who dedicated a full report on this. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, the resolution on the Right to Education of the Human Rights Council and other uh, UN um, experts. It has been also recognized already at regional level. Actually, the African Commission was the first one to uh, recognize the Abidjan Principle. But they also have been recognized uh, within the Inter-American um, framework and by the European Committee of Social Rights. At national level, uh, what is worth to mention is the Uganda High Court uh, have mentioned them in a decision directing the government to regulate private actor involvement in education, explicitly mentioning and referring to the Abidjan principle. And they have been recognized as well by other um, international fora. And it's worth to mention here, like they have been published in the International Human Rights uh, Law Review last year. So what are the Abidjan principle? It's a text of uh, 97 uh, guiding principle with 10 overarching principles. So each overarching principle uh, gives a top line idea under each one. What is important to understand is they have to be read uh, holistically. Uh, and not here, of course, independently. So the main themes that are covered uh, in the Abidjan principle are first, the state's obligation to provide quality public education. This is very important because for the first time we recognize the right to public education um, as an interpretation of, uh, of the state's obligation uh, under international law. Uh, there are sections on the state's obligation to regulate private involvement in education. Um, and there are sections as well on the financing of education, especially as well regarding public-private partnership and the um, uh, requirements that have to be followed. Uh, we, uh, they also address the role of donor and international actor, which are important uh, when we talk uh, uh, armed conflict um, situation. And also, as well, they cover uh, accountability and, and implementation um, questions. 
So just to focus briefly on how they apply to education in insecurity and armed conflict. So one of the main guiding principles that refer to this issue is the guiding principle 12 without S, I can see there are mistakes in, the, in it. Um, the right to education must be guaranteed even in time of public emergency and armed conflict. So this is important. The education and right to education doesn't stop because of uh, um, uh, emergency and armed conflict situation. So to highlight just few of them uh, because of time constraint, one to highlight is uh, guiding principle 34. As uh, I talk about the obligation of states to allocate the maximum available resources to education. And so when they reallocated um, their uh, budget to other area, which may happen in time of, of conflict, they may ensure that it does not impair the delivery um, of the right to education. Uh, when there are limited resources, they must prioritize the continuing provision of quality public education. Uh, guiding principle 43 to 46 are important because they look at non-retrogression measure, which may happen again uh, in time of conflict. Uh, so the guiding principle set up um, some guidance uh, saying, for instance, they have to be justified. Uh, this measure needs to be reassessed. You need to have a timeline to uh, address uh, the issue and, and go back to a, a better situation. Uh, the measure should be temporary, necessary, proportionate, reasonable and, and non-discriminatory discriminatory among other um, guidance. And another aspect to highlight is the part four of the guiding principle who are dedicated to financing uh, and especially as regards the public-private partnership. So I've just set here the overarching principle five that states like the states must prioritize the funding and provision of free quality public education so they can only fund uh, private education under certain conditions, which are set uh, in the guiding principle 64 to uh, 74. Uh, and one of them is like this need to be temporary bond. So this is super important in, term, in terms of um, uh, uh, conflict because we, we may have private actors entering uh, the education system because the state is weak or fragile and they need to be a support, but this need to be temporary and uh, this uh, need to be addressed uh, uh, in the future. And the overarching principle six, six have been highlighted as well. It's regarding international assistance and cooperation, which are important uh, in this regard. And again, they must prioritize public education and the core content of education, uh, including free uh, education uh, with a specific um, focus on marginalized school. So they are, are now in the five fa phase, sorry, of implementation, um, dissemination, translating in different language. We are drafting the commentary. A brief is uh, being developed now by INE on how they apply uh, in time of emergency. We are developing also indicators to monitor uh, them. Uh, we work with academic uh, to see how they can apply to research. They are already um, case uh, to court uh, using the Abidjan principle uh, and social mobilization and collaboration with uh, different actors, including uh, states. Um, so next steps is you because the Abidjan principle are known for by anyone. They are from all of us because they are uh, human rights law. So everybody can use them um, to apply that for advocacy, for research. Uh, on other things I have mentioned above. And you can find all information on the website, abidjanprinciple.org. Uh, we have a mailing list when we update about the Abidjan Principle and the secretary is still active and you can reach any of us for more information. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Delphine. That was fabulous. And I liked your kind of engagement with um, what's happening on the ground as well as more internationally. That's fabulous, thank you. And now Stephen. Stephen, you're still muted. Hi. You're off now. You're 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 no longer muted. Okay, that's great. I'm I'm really sorry. Uh, finger trap. Put put it down to my age. Um, I'm um, delighted to be part of this panel. Uh, very obviously, um, the um, the manual that's being launched today is. Um, has already got a, a very sound reputation from the first edition published, what, five or six years ago? And uh, it was part of a, a process, um, as uh, somebody's already mentioned, that Qatar uh, 
uh, the Education Above All Foundation um, was uh, partly responsible for, well, it was fully responsible for funding both the, the, the Bickle effort with the manual, but also a, 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 a separate process which I was involved in, which was producing international guidelines uh, for the protection of uh, schools and universities from military use. Uh, and I got involved in this process around about 2011. Now I was asked if I would um, get involved in this because not only was I at that stage uh, working in Geneva at the Geneva Academy um, uh, and the Geneva Center for Security Policy, but I was also a former military officer, not a military lawyer, a military operator and a military policy person who'd had a, a, a background, particular background in the production of military doctrine. So I, I approached the issue of what we should do to stop the military use of schools from both a legal um, academic lawyer's point of view and also a professional military officer's point of view. The issue of uh, the use of schools by military forces had been highlighted by a couple of my colleagues from Human Rights Watch, um, Bede Shepherd and Zama Kuss and Neff from the Children Rights, Children's Rights Division who had noticed that actually quite a lot of targeting of schools was not down to malicious targeting of schools, it was down to the fact that schools were being targeted because of the close proximity of military forces. And so the issue of whether or not military use of schools was a major problem um, was resolved as far as they were concerned. If military forces used schools or were very close to schools, then the schools were in danger of becoming legitimate military objectives. Uh, in, under the law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law, they could be legitimately targeted because they were being used for military purpose. So we, they, they, we came up with the idea, rather than going for some hard law, a convention or something of that sort, we came to the conclusion that probably the best thing to do would be to come up with some soft law guidelines. And uh, the process, I won't bother to bore you with the whole process, but it started in the spring of 2012 in Geneva. Uh, we had a meeting in Lusanne's in a beautiful chateau uh, that autumn, uh, just before Christmas. Uh, the guidelines which we produced were published finally in the, in the summer of uh, 2013. They were adopted um, and championed by Norway and Argentina. We did an awful lot of lobbying around the uh, state missions in Geneva, and that was a, a crucial part of the process, was getting states on board. And once uh, Norway and Argentina were involved, uh, of course, it went to state level. Norway very kindly then uh, put a lot of funding and effort in. We uh, launched the Safe Schools Declaration. The, the declaration itself was drafted by uh, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry, not by me. It was the guidelines that I, I wrote. The, the, the Safe Schools Declaration, which was the vehicle for the guidelines, was drafted by uh, the, the diplomatic staff in the Norwegian Foreign Ministry with one or two others uh, helping out in that process. Um, and it was launched in Oslo. Uh, Malala Yousafzai, who you've just heard about, her father spoke at that first conference in 2015. And the whole process of selling the guidelines and the Safe Schools Declaration to the international community really got off to an, an amazing start. And uh, Robert uh, mentioned that there were 102 uh, supporting endorsements. Uh, well, actually, you're wrong, Robert. There's now 104. So to bring you right bang up to date, uh, I, I'm staggered. When I got involved in this, I, I, I was delighted to get involved. But if somebody had said to me that by the time we get to uh, this stage, we would not only have 104 states signed up, including um, France and the United Kingdom, two P5 members, um, but we'd also, on the 29th of May this year, the UN General Assembly, in a unanimous decision, announced that the 9th of September would become the International Day for the Protection of Schools from Military Use. So every year now, and this is an annual thing, every year the UN will, will recognize that day as the annual day for the very purpose that the guidelines are being put to, which is trying to reduce the military use of, arm for, uh, the, the military use of schools. Uh, I'm very short on time, but let me just say one or two other, other things about this. I, I, when, I, when I started to draft these, because, I'm, because I came from a military background, I was very conscious that we needed very brief guidelines. If those guidelines were not brief and to the point, then the military would not consume them and they wouldn't use them. 
So we had to produce basically, ideally on one sheet of A4, actually really with a decent font size, it's two sheets of A4, but there are six guidelines, six basic guidelines that need to be followed. The aim being, they're not presenting new law. We were very keen to make sure that we, when we sold the guidelines to militaries, they weren't being obliged to um, uh, apply new law. They were simply applying existing international humanitarian law, but we were trying to persuade them to take action that their behavior would result in, in them making decisions well inside the limits of that law. So that instead of naturally choosing to use a school as a, a local headquarters and, and a school that's been abandoned in a conflict zone, uh, the use of it as a military headquarters is uh, something that is, is, is not uncommon. Instead of using a school, they would use another building down the road. We're wanting to get them to reduce their use of military, the military use of schools overall. Now we've got, as I said, 104 states signed up. I've had a very interesting time visiting schools and visiting uh, various other uh, countries to try and persuade them. Uh, Veronica Bear from Save the Children UK and I visited West Africa. Um, uh, to, in 2014, we visited I, in Monrovia in Liberia, for example, I visited both a school and the university, both of them still suffering from damage as a result of the civil war that ended 10 years before. If I went into a school there and I looked at it as a military officer, and I said, this is, this is an ideal establishment for a military headquarters. I went round and 10 years after the civil war in Liberia was ended, there were broken furniture, there was no lab equipment in laboratories, it was still suffering 10 years after. And about 95% of the educational infrastructure in Liberia was damaged in some way by that civil war. We've got the guidelines, they're endorsed by 104 states. But of course, we all know that endorsement, and as Roberts uh, related the latest statistics, uh, 11,000 attacks, 22,000 people injured or killed, in the last five years since we've been involved in this process, the problem hasn't gone away. What we now need to do is monitor compliance with these guidelines. It, the easy bit is, is endorsing them. We then have to make sure that those states that have endorsed them actually comply with the guidelines and apply them. So the, 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 there's, a, there's a conference planned every two years now. The next one is gonna be hosted by Nigeria next year in 2021, when I hope by uh, dint of medical science, we are all able to converge on Nigeria for that meeting. Um, the, the aim of those meetings in future must be to review uh, behavior, review the application of the guidelines. We are in a, in a sense, they're already established. A unanimous vote in the UN General Assembly over the day of international action uh, is as far as I'm concerned, there is nobody in the UN objecting openly to these guidelines. Therefore, they are accepted. So the next stage of the process involving civil society and anybody else that's interested is to make sure that the guidelines in the Safe School Declaration are actually complied with and applied in conflict zones. I'm gonna stop there so there's plenty of time for other discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you, Stephen. That was great and good the way you brought in the, this new development of the 9th of September as the International Day of um, Prohibition of um, Protection of Schools for Military Use. Great, thank you. Um, sure. Now I'm going to ask a couple of questions. While I'm doing that, I would encourage those who are listening to begin sending some um, questions. You've got some, but it'd be great if you could send some more. And so we have the opportunity of, of you asking questions you want to know of these uh, excellent speakers. Um, I have a question for all three of you. All of us, of course, have been affected by um, COVID-19, as Stephen was just relating. Can you each, in your own ways, consider how COVID-19, do you think, affects the protection of education? I'm going to start with you, Siobhan. Yes. So, although the handbook doesn't specifically deal with pandemics, it does provide a general framework applicable to human rights in emergencies, so it would cover covid and it details a law in respect of limitations and derogations to the right to education and other rights in particular. So COVID could be used by states potentially to justify a derogation from or a limitation to their obligations in respect to the right to education. And I would personally argue that it 
but it wouldn't justify a complete failure to provide an education, rather it would permit the state to provide education through alternative means, such as is being done. Um, so it might render face-to-face -face education difficult, impossible, but it doesn't mean that education can't be provided online, for example, by the state itself within their available means and resources. Um, or by posting work home to students. Um, so state, states should seek to provide education as best as possible in accordance with their available resources and means. And obviously available resources would include the difficulty many have, of course, of, uh, online. We, we're used to it, but of course that's not the position with many countries in the world. So yeah. thank you for that. Now, Delphine, what are your thoughts on uh, COVID and protection of education? Uh, I would say like I see effect on a short term and on a long term. So on a short term, I think there are some impact on, uh, especially on marginalized group uh, who are particularly impacted in terms of uh, conflict, uh, including migrants who have to move from their country like refugee. Uh, we've seen in, in us country, like it's have been a, a struggle for these groups who already have difficulty to access education. Um, and even for the kids who were in situation on accessing online education, we see it's been a struggle, even in Africa where there are not so much uh, internet access and, and availability. So for this group who are either in refugee camp or in very uh, unstable situation, it's, it's even worse. So this is on the short term um, impact. Uh, and, and also like we see in case, for instance, uh, between Israel and Palestine when there are conflict where these have been used to cut internet and to, and to then stop access to education. So erase, it, it's increased issues that are already there. Um, and on a long term, I think there are all these um, question around like how we want to transform the education system with the use of digital education and then internet. And as we see, uh, this can have impact on the, um, on the right to privacy and the data collecting regarding children. And as I just mentioned, like the, how this can be used as well for conflicts, uh, you know, like using internet as a way to increase uh, this, uh, this conflict. Um, and we know like digital education, uh, it's one way and it's a solution, but it's not enough. And, and, they, and when we talk of, of uh, early childhood care education and small kids who need to develop their brains, this does not apply, for instance. So uh, what will be the impact on the long term and especially uh, for the group uh, in a difficulty situation, as it is the case uh, in conflict, uh, this raised question, I think we should all uh, reflect on for the future. Thank you, Delphine. That's a very good point you bring up about the those who are marginalised and already vulnerable groups. What an additional impact that makes. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Yeah, I'm going to um, tell a bit of a story, really. I, when uh, Veronique Aubert from SAVE and I went out to West Africa in 2014, we were there just as the Ebola epidemic was uh, beginning. Um, uh, and that Ebola epidemic, which affected particularly Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, was one of the worst um, uh, epidemics uh, that they'd experienced. But one of the biggest problems they had in that region at the time was a lack of medical professionals. And the issue of children in schools, of course, is very important, but so too is the issue of uh, higher education in universities. Uh, the ability of that particular region in Africa to develop its own medical professionals at university level was severely severely undermined by the damage caused to education during the Liberian Civil War. Um, now, of course, the, uh, ac uh, the, um, uh, the disease in 2014-2015 was contained eventually because of a massive amount of uh, um, medical intervention from other states who were not suffering from Ebola. So for me, because of that experience in West Africa and knowing that Ebola was running and was, was being stopped by international medical intervention, to me, the COVID uh, consequences are states like the United Kingdom and the other European states and states with ordinarily an excess of capacity that could deploy into these regions I fear for them now, because if COVID takes off badly in that part of the world, there will not be capacity for international intervention. So I suspect that the uh, pandemic will be far, far worse as a consequence of the lack of basic educational infrastructure to create the necessary uh, 
um, medical professional uh, uh, structure that, that these areas absolutely need in order to cope with these these problems. So that's my take on the COVID problem. It's the fact that others are so involved in sorting out their own problems at home that they won't be able to intervene to help sort out problems in places like West Africa or indeed Africa generally and, uh, and, and other vulnerable parts of the world. Thank you, Stephen. That's very helpful giving that kind of uh, example from a previous situation. Also, I noticed when you were talking, you talk about um, uh, you talk about you know, universities and those kind of areas. I mean, in some ways, when we think of safe schools, we think of children, we think of protecting education, we think of children. Is protection of education under the safe schools declaration purely for children or is it much wider? No, it's, it's, it's schools and universities. And uh, the, 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 short, the short term for the guidelines is guidelines for protecting protection of schools for military use. But of course, the full title includes the word universities. We're talking about education generally. Now, the, the human rights lawyers amongst us will know that the right to education is not exactly the same. It's, it's, it's higher at the primary school level than it is at the higher levels. But you cannot run a proper functioning society without decent higher education. And we need higher education installations to be protected as well. So no, universities, uh, higher education, further education, uh, adult education is part of the part of the scheme as far as I'm concerned and I wrote the guidelines with a lot of other input from others with that very much in mind. It was not just about children although of course children uh, in many ways is what has what has caused the safe schools declaration to get such traction. Thank you yeah that's very helpful and Delphine what about the um, Abidjan principles to what extent do they consider protection of education beyond uh, the protection of children? So the Abidjan principle relate to the right to education under international law. And as we know, it's go from birth to uh, lifelong learning. And I think this is very important in time of conflict uh, because of the need to also get, get trained to new uh, skills, especially when we are moved or because the, uh, the situation change. Uh, so the Abidjan principle cover um, all the spectrum of the right to education from birth to uh, adulthood. Um, of course, some elements and some obligation of states, states differ depending on the level of education. So we know, for instance, in international law, it clearly states that primary education should be free and compulsory, and then secondary and higher should be progressively made available, uh, free. Uh, so they are an obligation of states, immediate obligation of states to take steps to make this happening. Uh, but in the Abidjan principle, we address this uh, um, this nuance in the obligation of states regarding the different level of education, but they apply to a level. Uh, and actually, I mean, we cannot deliver and have the right to education realized if we don't cover all aspects. So early childhood care education is as important as higher education. Of course, we focus on uh, primary and secondary education because it's a key uh, stage for uh, the development of an individual, um, but they apply to, to a level. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, now, now, Siobhan, once again, on that same kind of theme about um, where education is protected, can you think of examples where your work in the handbook goes beyond considering children uh, in its protection of education? Yes, um, the handbook um, does, of course, consider the protection of higher education as well as primary education. It addresses the whole scope of the right to education. And as Delphine just said, you can't fully realise the right to education without realising higher education as well. And as I hinted at during my talk as well, if you don't um, ensure the protection of higher education within an armed conflict or in an insecurity type setting, then you are losing out on a future generation of lawyers, teachers themselves, which again has an impact on education down the road as well. If you don't have teachers educated to teach, then there's not gonna be enough teachers and education is also impacted that way. Um, it, but in, it doesn't just cover the protection of the school itself. It also covers the protection of teachers, which includes all education staff in higher education and the lower levels of education. Thank you, and I guess it also includes the ability of people to go to um, be educated. So they need clean water, they need uh, those kind of accesses. Is that, and um, would it also include those, say, who come to education late, who are doing it at a much older age? 
Sure. Yes, of course. Um, so not only do, does the handbook um, discuss higher education itself, it also cons uh, considers foundational education. So that is for those who might have missed out on their primary level of education because of a conflict or an insecurity or because of any other reason, but especially it considers those who didn't receive a primary or secondary education because of a conflict or insecurity type scenario. Thank you, that's really helpful. Now, Delphine, Delphine, there's a question which has come up, which says, why were the Abidjan principles adopted and what were the issues it was seeking to address? Um, can you answer that question, please? Yes, maybe I, I will shorten my explanation because of the time. Okay. Uh, so what we see, so what, what, why the right to education exists first? is a recognition like for everyone to access education without discriminatory and so on the principle of, of equality and non-discrimination. So this is important to remind because what we see um, from several years, uh, it's a change. Uh, I mean, there are, there are an increase in equality and partly because we see an increase um, uh, involvement of private actor in education which impacts the right to education and particularly it's uh, access on a non-discriminatory and on an equal basis. Um, and so they have been developed in a very uh, rapid way uh, without regulation from the state. So in some countries, some private education just set up, even not under the education ministry, but as a company. So we see companies who develop making profits on education uh, well, while we know it's so important for parents and kids to get education, so of course uh, they, they go for this type of, um, of education when uh, the states particularly and, and we can cannot deliver a proper education. So it was this context which was changing, which not the case at the time when uh, international covenants uh, were adopted or even the Convention on the Right of the Child. And because of this changing context, uh, which, which was new, uh, we need to see how the international law apply to this context. And doing so, we realized like we needed to go and, and, and go for interpretation, jurisprudence, what, what the general comments have said, how this apply, what, how we apply international law exactly in, in this situation. And it's because of this need, like the Abidjan principle have been developed to really uh, put in one place the interpretation of uh, the right to education uh, in light of the evolving of the society, because the, the rights have to be uh, interpreted be in light of the evol evolution of the society. And because of this particular context, we needed to, um, to provide some guidance. And it's not just focusing on the right, uh, on, on the regulation of private sector, which are very important, but also they reaffirm the right to public education and the importance of states to put the maximum available resources to education. Because we often say like, States is not have the capacity to do it. They, they, you know, especially in time of, of conflict, you know, there are no capacities, there are no money, but there are other way. And, and we come up saying like private actors are the only solution. They may be a solution and they may be a temporary solution. But if we really want to guarantee the right to education and making sure this is the right for everyone, not just for a part of the society, then there are some principles to follow. And, and this is why the Abidjan principle have been developed to. To, to bring together all the um, legal resources around the right to education that can be helpful uh, to apply in this context. It's enormously helpful because we often forget the um, important role, but also the sometimes worrying role of private education in these areas. Thank you, that's really, really encouraging. Now, Stephen, there's a question for you, which comes up from fact that of course most conflicts involved these days it's a non-international armed conflict so there's non-state mm -hmm. actors involved and encouraging though it is that 104 thank you for correcting me, <laughs> states are, uh, have agreed to the declaration uh, how are non-armed groups being informed of this and, and helped on on knowing about these um, the, the, the this, is, this is a question i always hope someone will ask and and obviously somebody has done that precisely <laughs> Um, first of all, um, a, a very good organization um, uh, is called Geneva Corps, um, based in Geneva. And the head of Geneva Corps for a long time was Elizabeth Decker Warner. And Elizabeth is a very good colleague of mine. Um, she had representation on our working group when we produced the guidelines. 
So we very much had in mind the fact that not only did we want states to endorse this, but of course, crucially, as you quite rightly point out, the majority of conflicts have a non-international armed conflict dimension to them. We needed armed non-state actors to be engaged as well. So they have been, inv they've been involved or a, a selection of armed non-state actors have been involved in this process right from the outset. And indeed, when I was still in Geneva, uh, and shortly thereafter, I was going and occasionally being involved in the training of armed non-state actors in international humanitarian law. And Geneva Call have the guidelines as part of their education package for armed non-state actor um, operatives. They do sign up. There are a series of covenants that they sign in Geneva when they formally adopt international humanitarian law as their objective in, in conflict. So armed non-state actors are definitely involved. But of course, armed non-state actor, that, that covers a, a vast range of different groups. We are not going to get Boko Haram to sign the Safe Schools Declaration. Uh, that's obviously the case. There are, however, a significant number of armed non-state actors who want legitimacy. They seek legitimacy and they like to make sure that they are regarded as legitimate organizations. They have a clear vested interest in agreeing to treat education as responsibly as other armed forces would. Um, and indeed, I think some armed non-state actors are probably more responsible in this respect than some states. So uh, they, are, they are involved, they were involved right from the outset and they're still involved today, and Geneva Call uses the guidelines as part of their training package. That's really, really interesting. Um, can I follow up on that? Um, it wasn't a question, but I'll follow up on it. Um, one of, uh, aspect of which is, um, just to clarify, so the non-state actors um, sign up to Geneva Call, which includes the Safe Schools Declaration, rather than signing the Safe Schools Declaration, is that correct? Well, it, it is and it isn't, and I'd, I'd have to make absolutely sure that I'm saying exactly the correct answer here by going back to Geneva Call and asking them. But we wanted, what I wanted originally is I wanted Geneva Call to have a separate covenant, which armed non-state actors would formally sign up to. And when they formally sign up, they go to Geneva, they sign it uh, in the city of Geneva, and there is a ceremony. Uh, Geneva Call rejected that idea uh, for very sensible reasons. Uh, but they, they have incorporated, in the, it, it incorporated the guidelines in their IHL training. So any of the armed non-state actors that are receiving that training from Geneva Corps are being trained in the guidelines, Safe Schools Declaration, and they are in that sense, they are signed up to it as much as they're signed up to IHL. That's really, really helpful and really encouraging and a clever way of going forward if you think this is soft law, but becomes Absolutely. into action. And, um, and my, my experience of talking to um, both uh, soldiers uh, from states and also from armed non-state actors is that they actually see the common sense of this. Um, that's the most encouraging thing, I think, that, that an awful lot of what the military are commenting on is the, is the commonsensical nature of it. When we started the process in 2012, there were people in the room in Geneva who wanted a complete ban on the military use of education. And what I was able to demonstrate to them, I think, and not, not everybody was convinced, but most people were, is that when I deployed in Sierra Leone as part of the UK Joint Task Force uh, back in 2001, I was um, hosted by the uh, Pakistani brigadier who was responsible for that area of Sierra Leone, the diamond mining area up country. And they were disarming at the time and rehabilitating um, the RUF armed non-state actor groups. And I saw a school that was abandoned in that region. I visited it. It was being used as a reception base for, art, for, for disarming child soldiers. They were being disarmed. They were being put back into classrooms and they were being taught lessons by uniformed military personnel who were serving in UNAMSL. Now there was a, an example of a school being used by the military, but for a very understandable and defensible reason. So when those who argued that the military should have nothing whatsoever to do with schools, I was able to deploy that experience of my own and say, well, it's not always bad 
it can be quite positive, which is why we didn't ban the use of schools altogether. Thank you. That's a really helpful example, which is actually going to be our I'm going to ask the question. So you've answered it much very <laughs> cleverly with a very useful example. Now, the last question I have is one for you, Siobhan. Um, the handbook obviously has a huge amount of fabulous and interesting information on it. Um, how do you see it being used for training or in other forms? Yes, so it's already been used for training and I think it could be used further, for example, for training judges. Um, I hope it would be used particularly by those who are responsible for creating policy on the ground in respect of um, attacks themselves, the, the, the policies that impact how the military operates to protect education or fail to protect education. So that's how I hope it's used most. Um, I think it's also an excellent book for international lawyers as it explains particularly how the three areas of law interact with each other and it doesn't just focus on education, it also provides an overview of the three regimes more generally than education too, so it's useful in that sense. Um, we also develop teaching material which is available online and on the website of the British Institute of International and Comparative Law um, and there's also a summary for policy makers too. Wow all those things I remember when it was first launched um, back in the General Assembly um, 2012 I think it was um, that the um, then um, heads of the various uh, international committees the right to the child, on international economic, social, cultural, etc., all found it really useful to help them in their general comments too. So I'm sure that has now happened. I mean, it's, it's got a, a broader flow. Um, okay, well, uh, there, there are a couple more questions. I'm conscious now we've just got a few more minutes left. Um, so I was going to um, just r remind people that, of course, um, what happens when um, there is a, situation of, of breach, what happens to the victims? Well, Bickle has also produced a report on reparations for attacks against education, which is also available free online, because um, it's interesting the different forms of education reparations that are available. The Inter-American Court on Human Rights has been extraordinary on this and introduced everything from you know, allowing specific people to go back to school, to having memorials, to a whole range of different ways of having a form of uh, appropriate reparation for, um, for breaches of education, because I think that's important to see there are forms of reparation on this. Um, however, just to finish, to say thank you to the uh, three speakers who showed such expertise, brought in great examples to show the reality on the ground and the importance on the ground. And you know, as I began at the beginning, when there are that many attacks happening uh, throughout the, 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 the year on, on um, those um, who are either in education or education facilities themselves, there's a real need to remind ourselves the importance of the protection of education in insecurity and armed conflict. And so thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Siobhan Smith, thank you to Professor Stephen Haynes, and thank you to Dr. Delphine Dorsey. You've all added enormously and importantly to this. And I would just remind people that the um, handbook is available free online. And finally, to thank um, Bickle for putting this together in particular, because the uh, wonderful Kristen Hustler. Thank you very much.